You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I would like to begin by calling in the spirits to join us here today. So first, I call out to our ancestors, to those who lived well and died well and bring the legacy to us. I call out to those ancestors who bring all that is good and true and beautiful from our ancestral lines into our lives to assist us, the living, in doing what we are here to do in our time so that the things that need to be here for those who are coming are here, made well, and made ready for that which is to be. So I call out to these ancestors to be with us here today and gather round. Um, I call out to those who are listening to the show at any time. And I call out to those who want deeply for us to understand that there are great gifts for us, not only here in the everyday physical realm, but in the dream realm and in the realm that we access through our shamanic skills. And so I call out for those ancestors who had those skills and created those openings and helped us to find our way in that dream time. I call out specifically to those ancestors to be with us here today and to hold us that we might do what we've gathered here today to do. And with these ancestors gathered round, let us reach down through our bodies into the earth, deep, deep into the earth, to the very center of the earth, and take a moment and give thanks. Thanks for this beautiful day. Thanks for life. Thanks for the wonder and awe of life, the miracle of life. And thanks for the beauty, all the many moments of beauty in life, the great diversity of life. And the fact that in the center of this life that we are sharing is the possibility for change and transformation in any moment. We give thanks to the earth for all of these qualities present in her dreaming of life on the face of this planet. So we give thanks to the earth and call that energy up into our bodies that we might feel the energy of grounding and place, home, belonging, that we might feel the energy of hearth. We call out to the energy of the earth to bring to us the wisdom of manifestation that we can know how to be here in form in a good way. And we call out to this energy of the earth to help us to feel the connection within ourself, with others, with our environment, with the spirit world. And that we can know not only that connection, but the interconnectedness of all things. And may we somewhere in this day, with the grace of the energy of the earth, feel our oneness with all things. And to know our place in that great, great web of life. And we give thanks to the earth for all of this. And as we draw the energy of the earth up into our bodies, let us feel this energy in our bellies and our hearts and our minds and send this energy all the way up through the sky, out through the atmosphere and all the way out into the cosmos and all the way up, up through the sky realms to the highest power of the universe. And by whatever name you know this power, take a moment to connect to it, not just call out to it from down here below, but to reach it with the divinity in your own heart and your own being and to reach that energy and touch it and call it down through the layers of the sky, into our lives here, into your day, into life. And we call down in this way the energy of blessings, the energy of protection, the energy of devotion and generosity and benevolence. We call these energies into ourself and into our circle here. And as we draw that sky energy into our bodies, coming down through our heads, into our hearts and bellies, let us take a moment and really open ourselves to the intimacy of these two great legendary lovers, the earth and sky. And allow these energies to come together in wholeness within ourselves and in that space to open up and call in the spirit of the heart and let the heart be open and be itself, be its truly unique quality and to be that crucible that allows the passions of the belly to rise up 
and the clarity of the mind to draw down and let these energies merge in the heart in a way that allows the birth of that third and oh so sacred thing your true soul's purpose and may your knowing of your soul's purpose emerge in your heart today And may you find in your heart the courage to bring it forward in life, to manifest it in some way, large or small. So with the heart present in the center of things, the earth below, the sky above, and the ancestors gathered around, we give thanks for the spirit support here with us today. And I want to also give thanks to the people spirits who support the show through their donations, through their ideas for the shows, through talking about the shows, sharing it, linking from their sites to the show site, and in every way that we connect today to help the show to grow and to prosper and to be available free for those who are not able to donate financially to the show. So if this show moves you in any way in the heart, may your heart move you into action, and may your actions do something that helps to strengthen, to financially support, or somehow grow the show. And as long as we are able to do this in a good way and in balance, the show will be here for you all to receive. So thank you all. Um, If you don't know, um, there is a show website, whyshamanismnow.com. The archives are all available there, and there is a support button on that site, and you can click support and offer any amount, large or small. Um, It is all um, greatly appreciated, and it all goes to directly keeping the show on the air. So, um, I just want to mention that we are not actually live this week. This week, I am teaching um, the first uh, week of the four-year training as it begins again in this year. And so, we are recording the show. But if you do have questions about the show after listening, please feel free to email me at christina at lastmasscenter.org or our guest. So, without further ado, I will introduce our guest, Kelly Harrell. Kelly, thank you for being with us here today. Oh, thank you for having me. So for those of you who don't know, which is like two people on the face of the planet, but for those of you who don't know, (laughs) Kelly is an author and a neo-shaman living in Northern Carolina. Uh, Her memoir, Gift of the Dreamtime, Awakening to the Divinity of Trauma, chronicles her pivotal step into the role of shaman. And we're going to talk about her book today in part of the show. And she has been on a shamanic path for over 20 years. She works locally and with an international client base. And she incorporates other trainings, other ways of knowing, and other modalities into her shamanic practice, which is called Soul Intent Arts. And you can actually find this at, one word, Soul Intent, I-N-T-E-N-T, Arts, A-R-T-S, Dot com, And you can contact Kelly through the site. So if you do have questions from today's show, you can go to her site and um, send your question that way. You can also find her at kellyharrell.com, which is K-E-L-L-E-Y-H-A-R-R-E-L-L. And you can um, contact her that way as well. Um, Anyway, Kelly writes a syndicated column, Intentional Insights, Questions and Answers from Within. She's a contributing writer for the Huffington Post and a contributing book reviewer for Sage Woman and the Beltane Pages. She is also a proud founder of the Safe Room Project, a nonprofit um, support network for sexual abuse survivors and their partners, families, and friends. And she joins us today to talk about her work and the re-release of her book, A Gift of the Dream Time. So, Kelly, as you um, kind of reflect here, what inspired you at this time? Why, why was now the moment to re-release your book? Um, well, it, it came out of contract about a year ago, and it took me a while to kind of find my legs to understand what I wanted to do with it now and you know, to really understand what it had done prior. And in a lot of ways, I think being able to have that perspective let me shape, I think, where it can go now a little better than I did, you know, the first time it was released. I have a clearer understanding of my path. I have a clearer understanding of the publishing process and how to connect with people, you know, what about the book they connected with most. So it it seemed like a good time for me to to put it forward in a different way and um having your contribution to it i think gives it 
a little more grounded feel. And, and again, I really thank you for doing that. It was the foreword that you wrote was absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you. It was really my um, privilege and, and pleasure to do that. So, Kelly, um, why don't you give people just a little synopsis of the book and also tell us, you know, it's, it's so um, intimate. What really got you to write it in the first place? Right about my experiences with childhood incest. I I knew I was a writer in childhood, and I actually sat down to write this sort of autobiographical approach many times, and it just fell flat. It just didn't work, and I didn't understand why it didn't work, because I knew there were useful things in this story for myself, you know, to write it cathartically, but also that maybe other people could grow from, but it it just wasn't working that way. And so... I had um I had kept journals of my journeys for years just meticulous journals and um I had this growing sense that something about that era of my life just wasn't quite finished and I couldn't get to it no matter what work I did on myself or with other people I just couldn't get to it and so I had this dream that is in the book somewhere around chapter 10 and it was that dream that really catalyzed the whole experience and i realized then that it couldn't be written as this autobiographical you know narrative it really needed to be written from within my experience of dreaming so for those of you that haven't read this book yet let me share what's really unique about the book is that it's entirely about your experiences or Kelly's experiences in journeys and dreams. There's there's not any ordinary reality. Right. <laughs> and yet it you're you're such a good writer, you're able to tie those journeys into what's going on in ordinary reality. So it's obvious why you're doing what you're doing and how it all fits together as a narrative. But I have never read anyone write anything about shamanism that's so committed to the dream time i i can't tell you how it thrills me for you to say that because a lot of people wanted me to root it back into this journalistic style of you know what was happening in my mundane in the submission process when i was first writing it Mm -hmm. that was probably the core feedback that i got and Mm -hmm. i understood why Uh, you know i understand that's the self-help book model Mm -hmm. that we're Mm -hmm. used to and nobody understood shamanism in the publishing industry at the time (laughs) and when i was shopping this book in like 2003 um everything was very academic very anthropological and it it was what i kind of refer to as shamanism in the rearview mirror Uh there was no modern understanding that people still do this we're not just talking about things that other cultures do or that they used to do there there really wasn't an understanding of you know that we still do this and what it looks like when you're doing it not just the benefits that you get from doing it, not just talking around what you did to get to the level of empowerment or or healing that you're experiencing. So it was really important to me to keep it in the symbols, in the shamanic narrative. And so so that part of the book, you know, those of you that that do read books about shamanism it's very very unique and and so for those of you that send me all these emails and say christina do a radio show on how i can be a better journeyer um (laughs) read kelly's book (laughs) because not because the book tells you how to be a better journeyer it shows you what it's like to journey well and and also because kelly your book really begins at the beginning of even learning to journey right so it also shows your development as a journeyer it does i had um prior to this the early scenes in the book i had always experienced my guides in a more direct way i 
I mean, I was one of those people who did have very unusual experiences as a child, and I was highly aware that nature was interacting with me. It wasn't just something I was passing through. So I had a, a great awareness that I was interacting with my guides and that I was getting messages, signals from them. But until I really learned the mechanism of journeying, um, it didn't come together in an exchange it, it mm-hmm. wasn't a, a, you know, a shared dialogue until that point. And it's interesting to me how, um, I don't know if you experience this with the people you work with, but how often people who do have kind of that rich childhood experience resist the discipline of journeying. And then in that, never quite get that very helpful dialogue. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I do see that quite a lot. And I mean, I think part of that is pure excitement. I mean, I can only fault people for that so much. Um, But I think another part of it is there's been sort of a branding of what modern shamanism should be and what it should look like. And that approach has left out a lot of the um, the underpinning of why you do what you do and Mm -hmm. why you develop rituals around what you do and, and, you know, observations that you make to carry it forward once the journey has ended. Mm-hmm. Well, and and this idea that um, I'm this is this is a little bit rude, but basically I'm learning to journey so that I can now learn to do soul retrievals and extractions. Versus, I'm learning to journey so that I can work with my helping spirits to actually become a full human being. Yes. and then maybe I might learn how to do some healing. <laughs> right. I find that a lot of people come to me very excited because. They, you know, they have had these unusual experiences in youth or or throughout their lives, and they come because they want to be a shaman. And then they work with me for a little while, and they start to have those those shaping experiences that show you you can't overlook any part of yourself. I mean, you really can't leave out anything if if this is the path you're choosing to go down and it isn't that you know we reach this state of perfection and we're done we're all healed it's more commitment to the path period whatever it brings Mm -hmm. that's the part that uh really seems to sober people up (laughs) yes and (laughs) and that kind of brings us actually back to your book because the book um, the book is an easy read because it's so beautifully written, and you want to know what's going to happen next. So, but it's not an easy book. I'm glad you said that also, because <laughs> so many people would read the book, and that's wonderful, and they would come to me and they would say, "You make it look so easy." And you know, on the ego level, I'm like, "Oh, cool." But on another level, I'm like, "What part of this looked easy?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because man you are going back again and again and again around you know the same it's not the same thing but 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 the persistence to get to the root of this and to not accept good enough well part of that is probably just you know being new on my own path then and somewhat still now and you know just the, some in some ways the mistakes that we make or if, if there is such a thing as mistakes just you know ironing out my own way of doing things and you know the other part of it was just that feeling that wouldn't let go that I needed to really see how that that thread of uh, assault in my life was playing through and how I could let it go and and it is a thread and yet it's a it's a multidimensional thread, and that's another piece that's really excellent about this book. And I guess what I mean by that is there's the thread of the – not to belittle it, but the sort of expected or the – normal – I don't know what the word is. But basically, there has been um, incest and this sexual abuse as a child, and there's the, the path of healing that has got to happen relative to that. And yet there's also the thread of why are we coming together in this way in this life, the past life stuff. Right. And the karmic piece. And then there's also why in terms of how you're developing your relationship with helping spirits, you didn't even know we're there. You know, so that's like 
it's a thread. <laughs> it's a really it, it's true. Thing. I mean, it, it was a very complex thing, and and frankly, that process. You know, I was having this process that led me to approach healing in this manner that was difficult, but. And I guess this is the part that begins to carve out where you go or how you do your shamanic path. But it opened me to all this emotional stuff, sorting out all those many ways that that event was affecting my life or or not Mm -hmm. necessarily affecting, but clarifying. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's this other piece Maybe maybe I'll have you just talk about how you understand it for a while, but <coughs> which was there there are moments in your journeys where you check in with your higher self in the journey or dream or whatever. But anyway, in the book, there are moments where you check in with your higher self, and it's really helpful. And what I loved about it was I thought, oh my God, not only is she using everything else correctly. <laughs> Oh, well, bless you. You know, but she's actually using her higher self as a higher self because my experience with people is 75% of the time people check in with their higher self to get an answer so they can avoid doing what they need to do. Uh, I'm writing, a big, self, uh, I'm like writing a big an article out. on that now. I, I think that's big. You're hitting on something big. And, man, your higher self kicks ass. <laughs> she does. She's, she's yeah, not she's, letting you off anyway. She's not playing. You're right yeah. about that. A lot of times I work with people who, even when they are ready to establish those connections with spirit allies and totems and whatnot, they, they're they perfectly willing to hand everything over to them. And I think there are times when that's appropriate. There are times to say, you know, I, I can't do this and I need your insight. I need your help. There are times to say, tell me what to do. And there are also times to realize that you just kind of need to pick your yourself up even at that that higher soul level you really need to defer to your own spiritual wisdom and that's something that seems to be overlooked in a lot of modern i guess new age spirituality and yes and and there's a big and well okay so i have a theory (laughs) i have a theory which is that people actually take their judeo-christian model into this work with spirits without knowing it and they displace their spirits in the jesus position and they give over right i think instead of exactly right instead of transforming their inner um structure so that they really understand that they are one with the divine and it's from that place that they now interact with everything including their everyday self who's trying to remember to pick up the milk at the grocery store exactly (laughs) exactly you know bless her heart (laughs) Um, so the thing with the higher self though that you know it's it if we're gonna so how do you, how do you think of the higher self? Like like if you ha- had someone say, you know, you, you you want them to connect with their higher self and you don't think that they are, how would you talk about that with them? The way that I explain it to people, and and I'm, I'm you know one thing that I always tell people who ask me questions like that is I don't know I don't know <laughs> I, I don't know if it works the same way for me that it does yeah. for anybody else. And and if, you know, I will share with you the way that it has revealed itself to me. And if it works differently with you, then you need to go with the way it comes to you. So that's my intro to that. For me, the high self seems to be the highest aspect of my soul that is individualized as Kelly, that is sort of the situated between all of that enormous spirituality that that i kind of joke around and i say sounds like math it's like sacred math that all just comes in kind of garbled and my high self is sort of the filter that helps me align that in my earthly consciousness so that i can live it so that i can make sense out of it so that i can stay connected to the parts of me that are way out there that are part of all things Mm -hmm. mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, because there's no point in really being one with the oneness if you're not drawing anything into your everyday life from it. Yeah. 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 So anyway, everyone, so what we've been talking about is a book called Gift of the Dream Time. Gift from the Dream Time? Sorry. <laughs> Gift of the Dream Time. Of the Dream That's Time. Okay. 
um, which you which people can certainly get from your site, but can they get it on Amazon and everywhere else too? Currently, it's available in ebook format on Smashwords and on Amazon, and the second edition in print should come out in the next couple of weeks on Amazon. And Beautiful. after it's on Amazon, it will be distributed to all kinds of outlets. And so when it's available, so give it a couple weeks, everybody, and then run to your local <laughs> stores and start asking for it so they order it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And consider it as potential Christmas shopping. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> and then you'll have your shopping done and you can just relax at the holiday time. Yeah. Anyway, or solstice or whatever shopping you do in the wintertime for people. Yeah. Um, so, um, Kelly, speaking of all those other things, um, let's talk a little bit about what you do actually in your practice. Unless there's anything more you wanted to say about the book itself. The only thing I want to say about the book is that, you know, I've gotten wonderful support for it. And, you know, I was terrified to put it out there, partly because of the the unique approach it was taking to modern shamanic literature, but, but because it was, like you said, a very intimate story, and it has just been wonderfully received, and I, I can't express gratitude for that enough. I'm very thankful for the relationships that it has given me, the people that I've met. It's really been wonderful. And and, and I want to just second the just the way that this, the voice from which this is written. Yes, it is intimate. Yes, it talks about hard things. And yes, it's, it's an amazing journey of how we come to really understand um, and deal with the emotional uh, positions we don't realize we've even taken and how we untake them and, and allow things to flow again um, where we, you know, thought we couldn't. Um, anyway, what I want to say about it is I know for myself... You know, I was, used to live in Northern California when all of this started to happen. And I've been reading books about, you know, my blah, blah, blah journey for decades now. <laughs> and I honestly, I'm tired of that format. I get the fact that publishers want people to write it. But I've been reviewing some books or even looking at should we review them for the um, journal, for the Society of Shamanic Practitioners. And we're all tired of them. And mm-hmm. this book isn't like that. That's what I'm so excited about this book because I'm tired of saying people, the story is I, you know, I ran into the shaman and then my life fell apart. And, you know, it's oh. like, yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> and Do you like, know the one, there's another trope that really bothers me just, just while we're on that path, that people in Western culture feel they have to leave our culture in order to find that shamanic experience. Uh-huh. That's one that really, yeah. And like you said, publishers love it. Apparently, it sells a lot of books. Yeah, because you um, and I are chopped liver. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, my my favorite version of that is so and so spends thousands of dollars a year to run off to another country to be with a shaman, only to come back to America and have me do their soul retrieval work, but they don't have enough money to take my workshops. Oh, yeah. You know, it's and. Like, uh-huh. And I think a lot of people who do those soul journeys into other countries, they don't stop and think about the economic plight of those countries. I mean, they're just there because they want to do this soul work. And that's great. That's wonderful. That's empowering. But it's it's not a very green perspective on, uh, you know, what this path is kind of about, really. But uh, they come back, as you said, and kind of fall apart and they don't understand how they can't take that teaching from some other place and root it here yeah yeah and then the other thing this other thing i've been thinking about recently i haven't quite talked to enough people about it yet but the other thing is (laughs) in that exchange with spirit so i as the entitled american consumer go to this other country and enter into a shaman's relationship with the spirits they've cultivated, which is an exchange relation, exchange based relationship. Mm -hmm. And I go in and I have my, I'm entitled to enlightenment experience and take that (laughs) and leave. And we wonder why the shamans end up losing the energy of their spirit help. Right. And, and there's some there's this there's this really deep peace we don't get. It's not about our enlightenment. 
It's about our exchange of our gifts in the world and our exchange with spirit. And it's all meant to um, – we're not entitled to anything. There's nothing free here. And we exactly. we need to give back energetically. And I want to talk with Steve mm-hmm. Steve Bear about it because he writes about how Maria Juana, who a lot of people went to do um, – psilocybin mushrooms with and a lot of people that wrote you know original texts that people read in school when they study anthropology and stuff and those people had these amazing experiences with her and in the end of her life she really suffered so it's not just not green economically and ecologically it's not green for the shamans yeah anyway i'm I'm up on a soapbox here i'm going to fall off and break my neck so it's it's um, a good soapbox just like these things are like, come on, people. We and and then and and so where is that coming out of our need to leave? It's our belief that somehow because we're not indigenous people, we can't connect to spirit, right? I mean, exactly. come on, exactly. We're all come from the same first people, exactly. Get with the program. And I, you know, again, I understand why people would have that perspective because you know we haven't exactly respected other people's spiritual paths we haven't respected our own historically so i I, kind of understand that but um but yeah i like the soapbox (laughs) okay so before we got up on our soapboxes we were going to talk about soul intent arts and your work with people and in and in particular the aspects of your work that you are really your favorite things the things that you bring that are unique to the work um for example one of the things that you told me about was that one of your specialties is mentoring uninitiated intuitives through their kind of spiritual emergency and my first question relative to that was how do they find you that's always the question isn't it um they're having most an emergency. People, <laughs> you know at a very practical level most of them find me online and they find me you know in the wee hours of absolute panic to be honest i mean people don't still you know even though it's changed a lot in the just in the last 8 years that i you know really started you know being public with gift of the dream time you know people still don't really stumble into shamanism they're 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 typing that word into google because something's going on in their lives so usually people find me online occasionally they find me um through word of mouth most of the local people come through word of mouth mm-hmm. which i think is wonderful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the majority of people are kind of in they're in a um, a crisis though i mean that is what has led them to find me and so you know i was hesitant when i I was telling you the things that i tend to focus on because one it's taken me a while to to really know what i focus on and um and also i'm not really sure what uninitiated means maybe there's a better word for that but um again (laughs) is that good yeah people who have had these experiences that are outside of what we culturally accept as normal whether whether you call it supernatural metaphysical whatever i just call it normal but you know for the sake of keeping everybody else's vocabulary intact they're having experiences that they have either been demonized by their families or communities for having such that they can't you know they have to repress them or um, these experiences defy their own belief system, and they don't know how to re- rationalize what's happening for themselves. So I kind of help them in this process of accepting their their gifts and and finding a way to maybe be a little more flexible in what they believe as opposed to what they really experience, and and finding that bridge to the rest of society. I always think of that person, you know, they sit uh, across from me. It's, it's, I see it more when they're actually here, not so much working remotely with people. And, and they're starting to tell their story, and I'm egging them on, of course. And they, they kind of look up, their heads down a little bit, and they kind of look up to see whether I'm thinking they're crazy yet. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, they, and they're yeah. waiting for that moment when I go, okay, that's <laughs> enough. You really are crazy. And, yeah, and it doesn't or, come. Exactly. And, and they're exactly. just shocked that, that, that they're normal 
it's it is and i mean the other part of that is you know, I honor that these people are in crisis and, and that we have to, you know, form some kind of alliance between the experience they're having and the one they're supposed to be having and to um, to just help them find some sort of vocabulary for that and somehow still exist in the way life works and the way they're really experiencing it. There's also a point of ushering them into the realization of so what? So what if you're having this experience? It is normal. You know, there's a point where you have to look around and say, this is just the way my life works. It's not special. It's not different. It's not elite. It's just the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and if that voice that was talking to you wasn't a demon, what would it be? A dolphin. Really? How cool. (laughs) Exactly. you know, if you let it be what it is, what would that be? Yeah. yeah. So forming the tribe of the modern mystic has been my focus for probably the last two years. And I, I'm not completely sure what that will be. I want it to be a physical tribe. But at this point, it's been mystery school in person and remote classes. And it, it's gone really well. People seem to really benefit from the, the mentoring tempered with actual education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So tell people a little bit about that. So how, how do they find that and, and, and why might they look for that? Hmm. Most people seem to identify a point where they've lost power along the way. There's, there's been some sort of event that has just made them feel less than who they are. And they, through some wonderful, amazing connection of words, usually find me online and we open a dialogue. I really encourage people to form a relationship when we work. I, I don't I don't see people once and then they're gone. I also don't tell them they have to see me five times or what we do won't work. It's it's a fluid thing and I really try to build that in and let people know that whatever work we do, whether it's a solo session or whether they do go through the tribe of the modern mystic and they continue into studies that it's about a relationship that i mean i'm we need to be here for each other it's as you're saying we need to have that reciprocal exchange and so i set it up to be a very involved study mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then people can you can find that uh, they can click on it at soul intent arts right Yes. They can find out more there if they want to interested. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I've been talking about in the last two shows actually has been about different ways of thinking about and understanding our human the, the relationship of us as humans with the land and nature and um, it was all sparked by a a question from a listener about how her teachers had all taught her what I would call almost a dismissive relationship with the land that whatever you find here is problematic. Most of it are ghosts. Just send them away and get on with it. Yeah. And, and, and my perspective is much more, everything else was here first. Exactly. <laughs> I should be polite. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. please thank you, and I'm sorry. Um, so I was just wondering how you think about this restoring the balance. Um, between humans and nature and that whole part, I think that, well, I personally think has to be part of our shamanic work. I think so, too. Um, I definitely align more with what you're describing. I think nature is the veil. I mean, everybody talks about the veil. The veil's thinner at Samhain, and some people can pass back and forth through the veil as shamans. I think that is nature, and, and that and nature is indivisible from its spiritual I I don't know, power. I mean, all Mm -hmm. things are indivisible from it, but I particularly find nature as the ambassador to everything that we need to know and do and heal. And that relationship is probably foremost in shamanic work. I do not understand people who say that they are on shamanic paths and they never spend time in nature. I don't 
I don't understand that. I, I guess there are lots of ways that we can approach it. But um, the attitude that you're describing about, oh, just you know, dismiss it, let it go, don't worry about it, I have found that is what a lot of nature expects us to do. When I have done um, just focused groups connecting with a particular place, um, there's well, for instance, there's a park in Raleigh, in North Carolina, where I live, called Pullen Park, and it's on the edge of NC State University campus. And and that when I was in college there, it was called Rape Park. I mean mm. that that's what it was. And mm. so you know, I had some distance, and years later, I decided that was where I wanted to have Beltane rituals every year. And you know, Beltane's a big sex holiday. If you know, as far as a lot of modern pagan people approach it with and um i decided that i wanted to do it there because i wanted to have some sort of relationship with this place that had become so um sort of poisoned against the feminine and uh it it was amazing to go there it's a historic park it's a beautiful place and the trees were kind of like you know, Beltane, whatever. And I thought that was just sad and sort of funny because they had an attitude. The nature (laughs) spirits had an attitude. They were like, yeah, yeah, sure you will. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really powerful to build a group that goes there to the park on a regular basis to hold rituals solely to just connect with nature. I mean, we don't really have an agenda other than to say we're here and we know you're here. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have um, some retreat centers that we've gone for the for the um, four year training that I do repeatedly, and and over time there's been this oh you're back mm-hmm. <laughs> from the spirits of the land and it's so lovely it's like oh those are the people that do really nice fires they're back. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. I mean, they, they're hanging out here with us, and so many of us do the same thing over and over and over again, and they don't really expect us to notice and participate and interact and relate. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so did the park um, or did the spirits of the land there at the park want – do they – I mean, how do they feel about being called Rape Park? I mean, do they do they have a sense of that and, and wish for it to evolve otherwise? They didn't. And that's another thing that I found surprising is there is kind of a layer of the human psyche that that it's kind of isolated. It doesn't bleed into other things, which I guess I'm grateful for, but they really weren't aware of that. It's kind of like they were just doing their own thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was really actually beautiful. Mm-hmm. It was it was reaffirming. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's nice to know we can't damage absolutely everything. It's true. Yeah. I mean, exactly. That that was exactly the, what I took from it. I thought, well, on one hand, you know, I know I can ask them for help in in lifting this space and, you know, kind of giving this land a bit of a boost. But on the other hand, I thought, you know, wow, they, they don't have to experience this. They're totally outside of that. Yeah. I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do the way they do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I feel like there's an aspect of um, other practices that I've needed to bring in just so that I can stand up here and do the shamanic work, like Qigong and things like that, that mm-hmm. I think they're designed to connect us to that that dimension that realm that so. whatever where we get out of that tiny human drama space i and, think so I, and that's a great get, way to put it get into that big place where all that other stuff gains a more appropriate perspective perhaps i like that yeah yeah so is there a way that your own personal experience has i don't know this is on the line of as shamans, we all have gifts, and our experiences get woven into those gifts, and then that's 
the kinds of things we practice. So I'm wondering, though, if there are aspects of your experience in your abuse as a child, in your relationship, your own relationship with the feminine that sort of weaves into now aspects of your shamanic work in focusing with women or the feminine or anything like that. Hmm. I do seem to work with women who have experienced sexual assault quite a lot. I don't know if that is something that they they know about me and so they feel comfortable bringing that, you know, to the fore of themselves with me or if that's just kind of a commentary on our culture overall as far as, you know, women I think like one in three are sexually assaulted. Um, I do feel that I'm very good at listening to people. I mean, on, on all levels, however you can interpret that. And I feel like, you know, a lot of times people just want to witness. They just want someone who can sit with their story. And that, I think, is the foremost thing that I like to bring when I'm working with clients. Just the ability to give them space to bring whatever they need to bring forward. And so then with, do you find that people's abuse stories affect their, um, like it comes to play in terms of issues of fertility or miscarriages or are they separate? I know that sounds really like a weird question, but, well, but in that sense of continuing <clears throat> to play out these stories. I do find that the stories continue to play out. It isn't necessarily specific to um, reproduction, that that aspect of fertility, but I definitely see a correlation in creative expression, whether that is, um, you know, in terms of the fertile cycle or artistic or otherwise. I also see that a lot of women just seem to have... um, issues with their reproductive systems that have endured some sort of sexual assault. There's yeah. absolutely no question about that. Yeah. And there's, there's just such, it, it's a long history. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And, I, you know, in terms of my own story, when I began to ask the questions that would really take me deeper into my story, I learned some things I didn't want to know. I mean, I didn't want to think that it was bigger than events of this lifetime. And so, you know, there are those kinds of, of questions that come up when you're following that sort of thread. It, it's a heavy thread and um, you don't know where it's going to take you. That's the commitment. Yeah, yeah, and 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 without someone to hold the story, without help. I mean, I think there are places in life we simply need to ask for help um, in our process because it's easy to lose it in the sort of ever-growing cultural expectation of mediocrity. <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, and and when we go from one in three women to two in three women, you know, eventually everyone's just going to say, "Well, that's just what happens. Girls will be girls. They get that abused." That is what's happening. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. And there is no emphasis on prevention of sexual assault in terms of men's behavior, but rather what how women should modify their behavior to not get raped to start with. Yeah, I mean that's where that's where our media is pointing right now yeah and i think that for each of us as individuals i I don't know i have i i'm I'm just an exceedingly quirky person i think but every once in a while when i'd be in this problematic position i would think now wait a minute if humanity had been doing what i'm doing for like thousands of years we'd all be dead now (laughs) because this is really stupid So I know this, what you mean. <laughs> you know, so this can't be the thing to do, you know, so there's got to be, and this is like way before I had any ideas really, you know, this is in my 20s. I was, you know, dumb as a stick. So, <laughs> but, but this, like this interesting thing happened, which was as my um, period would start, I would be in so much pain, I would pass out. 
just wherever I was, I would pass out, which is actually really dangerous because you could hit your head on something very hard. And I would be in the middle of a business meeting in my suit mm-hmm. with my high heels and stockings and earrings and, and hair and, <laughs> and, you know, and pass out. I'd be under the conference table. It was horribly mm-hmm. embarrassing. Why? Because, because I'm having my period. You know, I mean, it's like, right. what's wrong with you? Are you sick? And, and this went on for several months and I just went, okay, this is one of those times. This could not be the way all women have experienced their lives forever because we'd right. be dead by now. You know, this right. is not right. And so I just tried to <laughs> tune in, you know, it's like this. And I just tried to tune in what is going on and what I got, even in my, you know, foolish 24 year old brain was you were given a womb which carries its own spirit. Talk to her yes. and stop acting like she's not there. Yes. And it changed within like two months because it took some months to remember you're supposed to be behaving differently. Exactly. But then you start exactly. behaving differently and this whole thing stops. This whole drama stops. And, 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 and so there is a level of practicality, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, where people need to start thinking, could this behavior actually really have survived time? And if not, there's got to be an answer that's already there in your body. Indeed. You just have to listen. I mean, I was, I was 20-something. That's not, you know, I didn't have any skills yet, and I could figure that out. You know, and, so, and I just think that women have such uh, profound wisdom if they recognize their womb as a teacher. It's a void for goodness sakes. The whole, you know, it's like it's our version of where everything came from. Life comes exactly, from, you know, right. you know it, it's a miracle. We don't, un- I mean, yes, we understand conception, but we don't really understand where life comes from. And yet we're doing it, ladies. <laughs> you know, so yeah. like talk to her. <laughs> Even if you yeah. never talk to any other spirit in your lifetime, talk to the spirit of your womb and, and watch your life change. That's I encourage people to totally rethink the spirituality of the body. I think one of the damaging things from the whole New Age movement has been that there's a ranking between body, mind, and soul. It's like mm-hmm. um, there's soul and then those, those other things. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I highly encourage people to consider that every cell, not just your body, your mind, your spirit has a relationship to the divine, but every cell has a unique relationship to the divine that we can tap into and do amazing things. Yeah. Yeah. We would be so screwed without our bodies. (laughs) I mean, I know we wouldn't be here without them, but the wisdom of the body is really the only thing that's keeping us alive, people. It is. It really is. And we it's just, true. We're so mean and we ignore it. And, uh, anyway. So, so we're kind of getting close here to running out of time. So I'm wondering, is there anything else about your work that you wanted to talk about that I haven't asked about yet? Probably the only other facet that I really like to emphasize, and people are like, you like to do this, and that's death work. Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, I don't quite know how I came into that, but I, I work really well with helping people move on and to help their families let them move on and, um, I really feel like even in the modern shamanic movement, we don't give enough attention to releasing souls that are ready to go. And they don't need to be in this, you know, level of things anymore. You wrote about that. On Did I? I, I? Well, not about yeah. that aspect of death, <laughs> but about kind of oversimplifying death. Ah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, we really don't have, we have um, traditions that allow us to just sort of accept death as something that happens and the very practical things we have to do to pick up and move on. But we really don't deal with the etheric aspect of death, you know, releasing the soul, releasing the earthly consciousness and releasing the chakra system and returning these things back to all things or, you know, the parts of the life force of of elders that need to pass on into the living elders. 
I I'm still formulating this, and again, I may be reinventing the wheel. Somebody may have done this already, but I really believe that a lot of grief at death is not emotional so much as it is the um, life force that we gain from parents and grandparents has not been properly reintroduced into the life force of the living. It has to go somewhere. It has mm-hmm. to either move on to the elders or it has to be given back or some combination. And um, I'm really, I really enjoy exploring that work. You know, different shamanic peoples, um, well, they all explore that work very in- intricately. It's interesting how they how men, how they see it differently but there is that sense that the soul is um composed of different energies essentially or mm-hmm. or just as you've said at death there's a lot of different energies and they need to go where they're going to go and they don't yeah. necessarily do that on their own exactly. and they need to be that it needs to be tended and um i always think of this one culture when i think of this whole idea i find it endlessly fascinating Mm -hmm. i I could have spent forever reading about people and how they thought of death and how they thought of the soul and then i got distracted and never you know and then that's (laughs) that's why it took so long for me to write the encyclopedia because i find things like this so fascinating but there was this one group i think they were in in central america or something anyway but their perspective was you're here three times if you do a good job, oh, and then you come back and you incarnate finally somewhere in the land. So they, mm-hmm. they would go to some place in the land to talk to their ancestors, quite literally. Mm-hmm. And if you do really well as an ancestor to your people, you get to come back as a butterfly. Oh, <laughs> I like that. that I like that a lot. I yeah. do believe we don't know how to die. We don't teach... You know, and this is this to me is part of shamanism. Everybody wants it to be all trance, and every you know we they travel out, and it's, oh, it's exciting, and you know bodies suck, and you know that kind of thing. But they they don't know how much of mindfulness you have to cultivate to be able, you know, to kind of be a responsible human to to really yeah. actively participate in the trance state and the body state takes mindfulness and i believe that is a component of dying Uh, we take it that we take with us Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's easier to die if we spend our life cultivating those things that we take with us exactly exactly And, and set right and reconcile and let go of those things that aren't coming with us which is a lot of life you know it's not coming it is a lot right yeah yeah i agree with you i think that that's a critically important part of shamanism because i don't know where else it's going to really get done because it's not just being a medium or things like that not to dismiss mediumship but you know it's more complicated complex than that and it needs to be attended and I, i also feel that after several thousand years not paying much attention to it there's kind of a backlog I, I think so. I mean I, don't, I mean, I don't know how to explain. I never, you know, when people talk about things like that, I don't know how to explain that in practical terms, but definitely. Yeah. Most yeah. definitely. I mean, I do a lot of releasing spirits from spaces and, and land or, you know, traumatized spaces. And every now and then I encounter one that just doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, I do the ritual for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and they never stop moving through. Mm-hmm. And I reach a point where I just have to honor my own boundaries and say, mm-hmm. I'll be back. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank I, you. I, um, thanks for re-releasing the book. Oh. Um, I'm honored that you asked me to write the foreword, but I'm really happy that you re-released it and and put it out there. Um, I think it is a good time uh, for all of these things you've talked about, like these aspects of it's you know it's great that shamanism has emerged yet again in America. Thank yes. goodness. And now we need to look at how that's happening and where it could be happening better. And I feel like you comment about that. Uh, in a good way, a lot. I mean, in, on your in your Huffington Post and the things you write, and that this book 
really is a beautiful example of what it means to use our own journeying and our own helping spirit relationship and all these things we've been talking about to truly pursue the path of our healing to its own conclusion, whatever that might be. Mm. And I really thank you for that. Thank you. So, Kelly, thank you for joining us today. And for those of you that need to be reminded... Uh, you can connect with Kelly through soulintentarts.com or just simply kellyharrell.com, K-E-L-L-E-Y-H-A-R-R-E-L-L.com. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Christina. So I want to thank the ancestors for being with us here today. Thank the earth below, the sky above, and the heart, that energy that unites us all. And thank you, everyone, for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>